Recording by Cooper Leith. The Letters of a Post-Impressionist by Vincent Van Gogh. Translated by Anthony Mario Ludovici. Section number seven. Letters to his brother. Part three. I must refer once more to certain modern pictures which are becoming ever more and more plentiful. About fifteen years ago, people began to speak about luminosity and light. Even if this was right in the first place, and one cannot deny that the system produced very masterful works, it is now beginning to degenerate ever more and more throughout the whole of the art world into an excessive production of pictures which have the same lighting on all four sides, the same general atmosphere, as I believe they call it, and the same local color. Is that good? I do not think so. Does the Roysdale of Vanderhoop, the one with the mill, give one the impression of open air? Is there any atmosphere in it, any distance? The earth and the air constitute a whole and belong to each other. Van Goyen is the Dutch Corot. I stood for a long while before the monumental picture in the Duper collection. As for Franz Hans' yellow, you can call it what you like, citron amorti or jaune chamois. But what have you gained? In the picture, it appears to be quite light. But just you hold something white against it. The great doctrine bequeathed to us by the Dutch masters is, I think, as follows. Line and color should be seen as one, a standpoint which Brackmond also holds. But very few observe this principle. They draw with everything, save with good color. I have no desire to make many acquaintances among painters. But to refer to technique once more, there is very much more sound and skillful stuff in Israeli's technique above all in the very old picture, the Van Voort Fisherman, for instance, in which there is such splendid chiaroscuro than in the technique of those who owing to their steely cold color, are uniformly smooth, flat, and sober throughout. The Van Voort fisherman may safely be hung beside an old Delacroix, such as Le Barc de Dante, as they are both members of the same family. I believe in these pictures, but grow ever more and more hostile to those which are uniformly light all over, it irritates me to hear people say that I have no technique. It is just possible that there is no trace of it, because I hold myself aloof from all painters. I am, however, quite right in regarding many painters as weak, precisely in their technique, more particularly those who talk most nonsense about it. This I have already written to you, but... If ever I should happen to exhibit my work with either the one or the other in Holland, I know beforehand with whom I shall have to deal, and with what order of technicians. Meanwhile, I much prefer to remain faithful to the old Dutchman, the pictures of Israelis in his school. This the more modern painters do not do. On the contrary, they are diametrically opposed to Israelis. That which they call luminous is in many cases nothing else than the detestable studio lighting of a cheerless town studio. They do not seem to see either the dawn or the setting sun. All they appear to know are the hours between 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Quite pleasant hours forsooth, but often quite uninteresting ones too. This winter I wish to investigate many things which have struck me in regard to the treatment 
in old pictures. I have seen a good deal that I lack, but above all that which is called enlevié. Footnote 21. A word suggesting bold virtuosity in expressing an impression. End of footnote 21 and which the old Dutch masters understood so perfectly. No one nowadays will have anything to do with Enlevier in a few strokes of the brush, but how conclusively its results prove the correctness of it! How thoroughly and with what mastery many French painters and Israelis understood this! I thought a good deal about Delacroix in the museum. Why? Because while well, contemplating Halls, Rembrandt, Roysdale, and others, I constantly thought of the saying that when Delacroix paints, it is exactly like a lion devouring a piece of flesh. How true that is! And Theo, when I think of what one might call the technique crew. How tedious they all are! Rest assured, however, that if ever I have any dealings with the gentleman, I shall behave more or less like a simpleton, but à la vieux Luc with a coup de dent to follow. For is it not exasperating to see the same dodges everywhere, or what we call dodges. Everywhere the same tedious grey-white light in the place of light and chiaroscuro. Colour. Local colour instead of shades of colour. Colour as colour means something. This should not be ignored, but rather turned to account. That which has a beautiful effect. A really beautiful effect is also right. When Veronese painted the portraits of his beau monde in The Marriage at Cana, he used all the wealth of his palette in deep violets and gorgeous golden tones for the purpose, while he also introduced a faint azure blue and a pearly white which do not spring into the foreground, he throws it back, and it looks well in the neighborhood of the sky, and of the marble palaces which strangely complete the figures. It changes quite of its own accord. The background is so beautiful that it seems to have come into being quite naturally and spontaneously out of the color scheme. Am I wrong? Is it not painted differently from the way an artist would have painted it, who had conceived the figures and the palace as a simultaneous whole? All the architecture and the sky are conventional and subordinate to the figures. They are simply calculated to throw the latter into relief. This is really painting and it yields a more beautiful effect than a mere transcript of things does. The point is to think about a thing, to consider its surroundings, and to let it grow out of the latter. I do not wish to argue studying from nature or the struggling with reality out of existence. For years, I myself worked in this way with almost fruitless and, in any case, wretched results. I should not like to have avoided this error, however. In any case, I am quite convinced that it would have been foolery on my part to have continued to pursue these methods, although I am not by any means so sure that all my trouble has been in vain. Doctors say, on commence par tour, on finit par grille. One begins by plaguing oneself to no purpose in order to be true to nature, and 
one concludes by working quietly from one's palate alone, and then nature is the result. But these two methods cannot be pursued together. Diligent study, even if it seem to be fruitless, leads to familiarity with nature and to a thorough knowledge of things. The greatest and most powerful imagination has also been able to produce things from reality, before which people have stood in dumb amazement. I will simply paint my bedroom. This time, the color shall do everything. By means of its simplicity, it shall lend things a grand style and suggest absolute peace and slumber to the spectator. In short, the mere sight of the picture should be restful to the spirit, or better still, to the imagination. The walls are pale violet, the floor is covered with red tiles, the wood of the bed and of the chairs is a warm yellow. The sheets and the pillow are a light yellow green, the quilt is scarlet, the window green, the washstand is orange, the washbasin is blue, the doors are mauve. That is all. There is nothing more in the room, and the windows are closed. The very squareness of the furniture should intensify the impression of rest. As there is no white in the picture, the frame should be white. This work will compensate me for the compulsory rest to which I have been condemned. I shall work at it again all day long tomorrow. But you see how simple the composition is. Shadows and cast shadows are suppressed, and the color is rendered in dull and distinct tones, like crepe of many colors. I have already taken many walks along the docks and dikes. The contrast is very strange, especially when one has just left the sand, the hearth, and the peace of a country farm behind one. And when one has lived for some time in quiet surroundings, it is an abyss of confusion. Once the war cry of the Goncourts was Japoncier forever. Now the docks are a splendid piece of Japoncier both odd, peculiar, and terrific. At least they may be looked at in this way. All the figures are constantly moving. They are seen in the very strangest environment. Everything is monstrous, and the whole is full of the most varied and most interesting contrasts. Through the window of a very stylish English restaurant, one obtains a glimpse of the dirty mud of the harbor and of a ship of the horrid cargo type from which foreign seamen are unloading hides and bullock's horns. And close by in front of the window, there stands a very dark, refined, and shy looking girl. The room with the figure, all tone and light, the silvery sheen over the mud and the bullock's horns, all these things produce the most striking contrasts. Flemish seamen with extravagantly healthy faces, broad shoulders, powerfully and strongly built, and Antwerpian to the backbone, stand there eating mussels and drinking beer, and there is plenty of shouting and movement. On the other side, a short little form dressed in black, with her hands on her hips, steals silently alongside of the gray wall. Her face, encircled in a halo of jet black hair, is a note of tawny, or orange-yellow, 
I don't know which. She has just looked up and cast a bashful glance with a pair of coal black eyes. She is a Chinese girl, mysterious and as quiet as a mouse, small and beetle like. Footnote 22. The German is once an Arctic, but the above rendering gives better idea of Van Gogh's meaning than a literal translation. End of footnote 22. In character, a contrast to the great Flemish consumers of mussels. Thank heaven my digestion has so far recovered that I have been able to live on ship's biscuit, milk, and eggs for three weeks. The beneficent heat is restoring my strength to me. It was wise of me to go south just now when my bad state of health needed a cure. I am now as healthy as other people, a thing I have but seldom been able to say of myself, not since I was at Noonan. It is very gratifying. Among other people, I mean the miners on strike, old Tangai, old Millet, and the peasants. The healthy man should be able to live on a piece of bread and keep at work all day. He should also be able to bear a pipe of tobacco and a good drink, for without these things nothing can be done. And with all, he ought to have some feeling for the stars and the infinite heavens. Then it is a joy to live. I should like to make copies of the Tarascon Diligence, the Vineyard, the Harvest, and the Red Cabaret, especially of the Night Café, for its coloring is exceptionally characteristic. There is only one white figure in the middle, which will have to be painted in a fresh and improved in drawing, although it is good as far as its color is concerned. The South really looks like this. I cannot help saying so. The whole scheme is a harmony in reddish green. I do not need to go to the museum to see Titian and Velasquez. I have studied my trade in nature's workshop, and now I know better than I did before I took my little journey what is above all necessary if one wishes to paint the South. Heavens, what fools all these painters are! They say that Delacroix does not paint the Orient as it is. Only Parisians, Jerome, etc., can paint the Orient as it is. Is that their claim? It really is a funny thing, this business of painting. Out in the wind and the sun, and when the crowd looks over one's shoulder, one simply sets to like mad as if the devil himself were at one's back until the canvas is covered. It is precisely in this way that one discovers what everything depends upon. And this is the whole secret. After a while, one takes the study up again and attends a little more to the form. Then, at least, the thing looks less rough and more harmonious, and one also introduces something of one's own good cheer and laughter into it. I am well aware of the fact that, to be healthy, one must resolutely wish to be so. Pain and even death, must be faced, and all individual will and self-love must be renounced. That is nothing to me. I wish to paint and see men and things, the whole of pulsating life, even if it 
be only deceptive appearance. I, the true life, is said to consist of something else, but I am not one of those who do not love life, and who are ready at all times to suffer and to die. A man with my temperament can scarcely have success, lasting success. I shall probably never attain as much as I might and ought to attain. I still believe that Gauguin and I will one day work together. I know that Gauguin is capable of greater things than he has given us already. Have you seen the portrait he painted of me while I was painting some sunflowers? My expression has certainly grown more cheerful since then. But at that time, I looked just like that, absolutely exhausted and charged with electricity. If I had then had the strength to pursue my calling, I should have painted saintly figures of men and women from nature. They would have looked as if they belonged to another age. They would have been creatures of today, and yet they would have borne some resemblance to the early Christians. But that sort of thing is too wearing. It would have killed me. Nevertheless, I will not swear that later on, perhaps, I may not take up the struggle again. You are quite right, a thousand times right. One should not give a thought to such things. Painting studies is simply a taking of herbs to calm one. And when one is calm, well, then, one does what one is fitted for. It really is a pity that there are so few pictures of poor people in Paris. I think that my peasant would look quite well by the side of your Lautrec. I even flatter myself that the Lautrec would look all the better for the strong contrast. Well, my picture would necessarily profit, too, from the peculiar juxtaposition, because sunniness and scorched tawny coloring, the hot sun and the open air are thrown into stronger relief by the side of the powdered faces and the smart dresses. What a shame it is that the Parisians show so little taste for vigorous things, such as the Monticelli's, for instance. Of course, I am well aware of the fact that one must not lose courage because utopias do not come true. All I know is this, that everything I learnt in Paris is going to the deuce, and I am returning to that which seemed to me right and proper in the country, before I had become acquainted with the Impressionists. I should not be at all surprised if, within a short time, the Impressionists found a great deal to criticize in my work, which is certainly much more under the suggestion of Delacroix's painting than of theirs. For, instead of reproducing exactly what I see before me, I treat the colouring in a perfectly arbitrary fashion. What I aim at above all is powerful expression. But let us drop theory and allow me rather to make my meaning clear to you by means of an example. Just suppose that I am to paint the portrait of an artist friend. An artist who dreams, dreams, and who works as the nightingale sings, simply because it is his nature to do so. Let us imagine him a fair man. 
all the love I feel for him, I should like to reveal in my painting of the picture. To begin with, then, I paint him just as he is, as faithfully as possible. Still, this is only the beginning. The picture is by no means finished at this stage. Now, I begin to apply the color arbitrarily. I exaggerate the tone of his fair hair. I take orange, chrome, and dull lemon yellow. Behind his head, instead of the trivial wall of the room, I paint infinity. I make a simple background out of the richest of blues, as strong as my palette will allow. And thus, owing to this simple combination, the fair and luminous head has the mysterious effect upon the rich blue background of a star suspended in dark ether. I proceed in much the same way with the portrait of the peasant, but one ought to picture this sort of fellow in the scorching noonday sun in the midst of the harvest. Hence, this flaming orange, like a red-hot iron. Hence, the luminous shadows like old gold. Ah, dear friend, the public will see only a caricature in this exaggeration. But what do we care? We have read La Terre and Germinal. And when we paint a peasant, we wish to show that this reading has become part of our flesh and blood. I can only choose between being a good and a bad painter. I choose the former. End of section 7 Recording by Cooper Leith